So maybe um, I'll start from the end and this beautiful drone sequence with shooting up from the kind of the tree towards the canopy and the brilliance of the sun. Um, and earlier today when we were in conversation, you were telling me about this, the idea of education from, um, from the tree, from its roots to the canopy, um, as being behind the pedagogical thinking, but also the cosmogony of, of the Gorian um, poetry. And I was wondering if we could maybe start by that, uh, linking also to the kind of ecological thinking behind the film. Sure. Um, <coughs> thank you, Sophia. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for staying with us through the film. I would just like to say that the projection wasn't the greatest. This um, colors were kind of a bit muddy and sound was a bit ah, but uh, the sound was great. Um, yes, the tree. Um, I think one has to put this into context of a larger uh, frame which is uh, basically Bengal at this time uh, that Tagore started, that Tagore built uh, Shanti Niketan. Um, one has to put it into context of the Bengal famine, the violence of imperialism that, you know, the British entered Calcutta first. So you have, um, you know, the longest resistance to the British there. You have the longest history of the left in Calcutta, in Bengal, but you also have the most kind of horrific uh, violence that was leveled upon the Bengalis for their great intelligence at, you know, fighting the British. Um, and so the Bengal famine was created. So within this context of pure abjection and you know, you also simultaneously had from, uh, emerged from Tagore's family, the Bengal Renaissance, which was a kind of movement of theatre, dance, writing that was uh, putting in its vision the, 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 the violence of imperialism, but also the generation of a language to defeat that. So a form of resistant aesthetic, let's say, towards that. So Tagore was brought up as a child, you know, sent to a British school um, in Calcutta, and he found the violence of that schooling profound. You know, he, he, he couldn't bear the kind of being in the classroom, the separation from land. Um, this, uh, you know, British imperialism, of course, we all know was violent, but what it also didn't fully, well, the also part of the violence was its, deanimation of um, the world, <laughs> but also the relationship towards subject and object deep within Hindu philosophy in Advaita Vedanta, not Hindu fundamentalism, but philosophy, <laughs> is the idea that subject and object are not separate, that matter and human are not separate. So that the experience of the world and the body are, are one. There is this continuous merging with form, um, in order to see the illusion of uh, the idea of being a single human. So the decolonization was not, so Tagore's school I see as a kind of, as a, as a place within which decolonization was active because he was putting children under trees to learn. Um, the schooling began in Kala Bhavan, but it was also extended to Sangeet Bhavan where you see all the dancing and singing going on. And the lady who's singing, Ranjani Ramachandran, is a very famous singer and um, teaches at the school. And, you know, basically this uh, space that Tagore created was um, a place where the arts was rightfully put back into place in a school. Because in the ancient Indian system, the arts were considered central. For instance, in the ancient courts of India, the courtesan came to the court to speak and orate, but she would have to speak about the eight principles of the universe. So eight principles being kind of mathematics, or I mean, there's mathematics, arts, philosophy, history. Um, so the British were not coming to an uncivilized whatever they might, they were coming to a deeply complex, you know, part of Asia. The other thing to say is that also 
Tagore was not a nationalist, so he didn't see Asia as being, uh, he, he didn't see, he was a Eurasian as much as he was an Asian. He didn't see a, he wasn't a nationalist, so there's a lot of very interesting debates that he had with Gandhi about this. But to put it into, to, to come back to your question about the tree, I mean, the pedagogy of tree learning was basically to put children outside, to revivify their sense of space with the land, to get a sense of their bodies inside nature, that nature was not just a space of violence, but it was a place of thinking. Um, the tree represent this tree in the film is like the oldest tree there. It's like 150 years old or something. It's a banyan tree, which I think is an incredibly um, complicated I instrument because it kind of just settles wherever. It's like this alien figure. It makes Ridley Scott look ridiculous. It's just this amazing embodied alien thing. Um, and and there, it's also important to mention, sorry, that Tagore also built another school called Srinaketan, which was really about rural redevelopment and is still in existence. So children who go there learn to weave, they learn to you know, work with electrical circuits, they learn to do woodwork. So he wasn't saying, OK, now you are, you silly villagers, you all have to learn, you know, education means having to go to the city. He was like, no, textile and um, pottery and uh, agriculture are as important to life as, as other forms of learning. So it was a very open, kind of interesting space. I mean, my aunt went there, my grand-aunt went to Shantinaketan. It was also very uh, important in terms of women. Women could go to Shantinaketan. He put dance back into the culture of learning because dance was also something frowned upon by the independence movement as, you know, the British colonial, British col colonization was also very Victorian, you know, so mm -hmm. it was very repressed. And women in the upper classes of India were very repressed and, you know, dare stumble into the arts. So he brought back the arts in, you know... I mean, Tagore, we can go on and on about him. He was a novelist, he was a playwright, he was a choreographer. He was an incredible figure who really was, like, building a kind of structure of decolonization and trying to put it into the central frame of the subcontinent at the time. Thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> are there any questions... Uh, from the audience. Well, a question back there, yeah. Hello. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. Um, thank you for that. I'm actually from Calcutta, so that brought back a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about the architecture of the film um, in relation to the myth and the archetypes and the various body of bodies of work, I, might, I should say, um, that Tagore has. Because for me, it was an intriguing trajectory. You kind of mapped these various spheres, maybe, of Tagore's work, and then you kind of go on this strange, downward, deepened, spiralistic journey, um, especially ending with the bowel singer that we're kind of following, right? Almost like this Virgilian guide. Um, so. But, but you never quite leave those elements behind. It's, it's accretional. It takes, you, you take dance and song along with you um, on, this, on this trajectory, right? So I'm just curious about how the style and the sheer breadth of his work, um, how you approached it and how that structured and framed the way in which the architecture of this film came to be. Um, thank you for that question. I think um, your point about accretion is a really good one. Um, you know, I think Anjali's known Tagore's work through her family and her father's work for a long time, but I came to Tagore's work around about, um, when was Tagore and Visual Cultures? When was that project? 2013? Mm. Something like that. Um, Grant Watson, um, the curator who curated uh, the show that's here and who's created the Bauhaus Imaginista cycle of exhibitions, um, he began a project about five, six years ago called Tagore and Visual Culture. And then he followed that up with a second exhibition called um, uh, The Santal Family uh, 
positions around an Indian sculpture. So that second exhibition was around the work of Ramkinka Baiju's uh, famous uh, sculptor, sculpture from the 1930s. And you can see in the opening section there's a kind of... You can see that the campus is, is the home for a kind of open-air exhibition of uh, Ramkinka Baiju's work, as well as the other key modernists, you know, Subramanian, uh, Benod, Bahari, Mukherjee, these figures. Um, so we've been engaging with his work since for five, six years. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, to link back to Sophia's question, um, this relation between sky and earth. Um, once we got to Shantanikate and, and went there several times in these, this five-year period, spent increasing amounts of time. Ten-year period. Yeah, and spent increasing amounts of time in the campus and uh, in a way slowing down to the ecological temporality of that space, the multiple time frames. Um, what became clear was that uh, Tagore and his, uh, his team had, uh, had engaged with the actual, um, the actual ecology of the site. So there were existing banyan trees, but Tagore had brought new trees and planted those. And Tagore had brought soil from riverbeds and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd, re he'd effectively done a kind of small-scale terraforming, a small-scale geoengineering. He'd transformed the, the entire campus so that we started thinking of, uh, of this work on the soil and this work on plants and trees and flowers and then the spring festivals that he developed around the planting of trees. We started thinking of, of these, uh, the poetics and arts and crafts of soil and botany as part of the Tagorian project, as well as the, the poems and the dances and the songs and the novels and the texts and the education. We started thinking of a pedagogy of soil and a pedagogy of trees. And then it became a question of, well, how do you how do you film soil anyway? And how do you film trees anyway? So, you know, when you go up to the crown of a tree, the crown of a tree has a, has a direct relation to, the, to, the, uh, to the, the spread of the roots. The roots of any tree are twice the size of its crown. So when you see the crown of a tree, you have to imagine the, tree, the roots spreading out twice that length. So you can imagine how far those roots stretch. So we had a fantasy at one point of making an animation that could travel along those roots and you would see the roots spreading. But animation, of course, is a whole other project. So instead of doing that, we settled for this kind of, um, this movement from sky to soil, this movement from crown to ground. So you see these continuous vertical and horizontal movements. And I would say this is, I would say the architecture is not only, it includes buildings, of course, it includes departments, but the architecture in the sense of instituting, inaugurating, founding a space, in that sense we wanted to expand the question of architecture so that it's, it, it's, its porosity opens out into questions of environment, questions of ecology, so that the trees and the soil are as much elements of architecture as the buildings or the murals or the sculptures or the, or the kind of uh, the perimeters that people sit on. So that, that starts to explain the continuous horizontal and vertical movements, the aspiration it explains why we tried to use a drone in the first place. We argued about the drone a lot. Sometimes we were like, the drone has too much of the language of advertising or sports Militarist. or the military. We argued for it over and over again. But at this point, we didn't really know any other way to get at that crown. We didn't have a helicopter. Yeah. So, you know, you, that kind of, um, it's a shortcut to the epic. It's a shortcut to, to majesty, actually. Uh, and so uh, it started to make sense in relation to 
the, uh, the shlokas that the children were reciting. Um, so yeah, so I would say that's how the, the cinematography tried to evoke uh, a sense of scale of, of what we were reaching for. And I think also in all of our work from the first film, which was a film where a gravity, where an agravic space was opened up between Earth and the body because we, we trained as cosmonauts and we performed 26 parabolic flights in zero gravity. Um, and our first film was a meditation on groundlessness and on the Earth. And I think from that point onwards, we, 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 we realized, I mean, that was in 2003, 2002, we realized that the, the, the idea of the post-human and a kind of um, a, a, um, a, a sort of a willing alienation from the idea of human was important in terms of understanding what it means to uh, decolonize from the, you know, from the structure and the conditions of what it means to be human. So the work has almost grown into itself since it, since it began. So this agravic um, space of earth and sky or the cosmos has always been in our practice. We have always tried to see things from that perspective in most of our practice in terms of scale. And there seems to be also a sense of, of study in the narrative st structure, mm. um, in a way. Um, but thinking of Tagore as this sort of cosmopolitan uh, world historical figure, um, something that also runs across your, your films, and particularly in this one, is this sort of transnational aesthetic or a sense of black internationalism that comes or that communicates anti-colonial sensibilities through music, uh, performative gestures, aesthetics. And I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit more about this as well. Yeah, I think between, um, between the transnational and what Cobner Mercer calls the translational, mm -hmm. um, I think um, Tagore was an extremely cosmopolitan figure. I mean, partly because of his his kind of aristocratic network that he was born into and that he cultivated, but also because he went on international lecture tours to raise money to to pay for the school. So he cultivated, you know, all kinds of intellectuals all over the world, in Asia, in America, in Europe. He was in a continual correspondence with uh, figures like Du Bois, figures like Einstein. I mean, he was just a, a grand figure. We always joke that, um, that Gandalf the Grey, Tolkien's Gandalf, is based on Tagore because that look of his... I mean, you see, we, there's no pictures of Tagore at all in the video, which is deliberate. But if you've seen him, he has long silver hair, he has a grey beard, he has a robe. I mean, he invented that look. It's not like there were many people dressing like that. No, he, he, like, he designed himself in that way. So um, uh, he was very much part of a kind of cosmopolitan anti-imperialist network, a kind of spiritual anti-imperialism, which really traversed Asia, Africa, America and Europe, and so they were allies everywhere. And he tried to make um, he tried to make Shantaniketan a hub for that. The kind of impetus of the film, though, is is neither to make a hagiography, nor to make a history, nor to make a biography. I wouldn't say we're especially qualified to do any of those things. They were Tagore scholars, who are far more capable of doing that. They were great films already by Sajidit Ray and Ritvik Guttak, which already uh, uh, fulfill those imperatives. But we did think a lot about study, and we, we think of this work as a kind of study of study, in the sense that everything you see are, you know, are students at work and play, like everything from learning Chinese to learning specific dances to uh, learning history to gardening. 
So it's a, it's a portrait of study. And then, of course, there are multiple meanings of that word study, you know, the, the notion of the etude, the piano study, but also the notion of study in the way that Fred Moten and Stefano Harney talk about black study and black studies, the study that is formal and the study that is sociality, the study that you do with your friends hanging out. Um, and we try to take these ideas very seriously um, and to, um, to expand the notion of study so that um, you see something like a, a, the different um, temporal vectors at which study happens. But it's also important to be quite, um, to say, you know, also to put this in context. You know, Shantiniketan is not some halcyon space anymore. It is completely polluted with plastic everywhere. The vice chancellor now is a Modiite. Luckily, we got into this in at the point where this vice chancellor who recites the poem is a Tagorian philosopher, and she let us film everywhere because she's actually like got a she was actually had a heart and mind. Whereas now there's this Modiite. Everyone who speaks against Modi is under threat. It's like their wages are docked. I mean. You know, it is a horrific situation. The students are always on their phones. They fall asleep. You know, it's like we made this film also to show in Shantiniketan to kind of bring back this kind of Tagorian ethos, if you like, for the students. And hopefully we're going to be screening it uh, in February there for the first time outside. Um, because it's like, where, are, where is this vitalism now in India to fight this, not a colonialism from the outside, but a terrifying colonialism from the inside. Um, so it's, um, it's a very uh, abject condition situation there, so in India right now. It is, imagine, you know, America after 20 years of Trump. This is what India is like. It is full of trolling Hindu fundamentalist haters who just want to lynch and kill everybody. I mean, it's a really terrible situation. So I feel like when we made this film, there was just enough magic in the air and just a few good coincidences that happened to make it happen. And, um, you know, just to be kind of, re to, you know, put into context what's really going on there. I mean, all progressives, people who are speaking out against Modi are being having their citizenship taken away from them. Two million Muslims have had their citizenship stripped from them. They're building concentration camps outside Bombay. So India is no, you know, Om Shanti anymore. You know, it never was. It never was. But far you know, from it. I mean, it's like that, that, that India has, you know, um, that idea of India, that you know, that Tagore also kind of created as well, that people wanted to go there and, and um, search for truth in a way has gone, you know, it's like, it's an app. You know. <laughs> um, I suppose drifting off of this uh, question of rise of populism, but also mm. uh, relating back to, you, you brought up the notion of, of etude, Kodra, so I guess uh, using this as a segue to, to speak about other films that you've made as well. Um, I'm wondering how thinking of, of the notions of etude or, or the fugue in musical language, um, how this um, sort of the, the thread of, of, of a sense of, of a making of a historical avant-garde that is incomplete, that is um, and the making that is diffractive, that is transnational and that runs across um, different films, for example, with the third part of the third measure or uh, people to be resembling. I was wondering if we could speak a little bit about this idea of, of sound and the methodology for listening that you also put forth within your work. I mean, we both come from music, that music, you know, like, I think Britain in the 80s was, you know, very exciting in terms of pop, in terms of pop, in terms of music, also, video documentary was also really exciting. Um, it was a way to kind of take down imperialism and class and, you know, just, just 
the idea of making albums and singing, for me, I was a musician, was just like the most important thing in the, you know, to me. Um, so the sonic, um, for us a film has to have the same energy as like a great piece of music um, that you can listen to over and over and over again your whole life. So what kind of music is that? I mean, that's all kinds of music, but free jazz is, you know, in the middle of it because it can, you know, you can, or Indian classical music, they're kind of similar. Um, this sense of the audible and the oral, I mean, it is just another, it's another sense. So that sense and the visual sense are in, they have to relate. I mean, all, I mean, cinema is as important, cinema is not, cinema is oral as much as it is visual. People tend to forget that, but, you know, um, we work with the same sound designer now for like 10 years and, um, and it's a long, uh, it's, a, it's a relationship that requires just as much work as the shoot requires and as the, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a, um, it's a process that, that one learns from as one makes each work. But I think in the third part of the third measure and in People to be Resembling, these were both films about musicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the third part of the third measure, which is a long story, was a study of playing a piece of music. Um, but that um, was, a, we called it a, a film in the key of listening, you know. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's Anjali's touches on the key, which is that you don't only make a film about music or on music. You want to musicalize film. That means not only framing music that is happening in front of you, making music the subject of your frame, the subject of your microphone, but also using music to edit with, uh, using music as a guide to editing, using music as a guide to how you shoot, how you direct. So using music as a principle that shapes the whole work you're doing. So in other words, music shapes the image. It's not only that the image captures the music, it's that the music guides the image. Um, and I think this is the thread. So in the, in the, the video on Julius Eastman, the, the aspiration there is not only to film four pianists playing Julius Eastman's music, it's to, it's to make a film in an Eastman style. It's to edit according to Eastman, to be guided by the music so that the music in some way is directing the edit. In the Cadona video we made called People to be Resembling, which is about a trio of musicians called Cadona, led by the great trumpeter Don Cherry, the percussionist Nana Vasconcelos from Brazil, and the, white, the brilliant white American multi-instrumentalist Colin Walcott. Um, they were very interested in permutations. There were three musicians, but each of them were multi-instrumentalists. <coughs> so they could each play 10 to 15 instruments. So you have three men, but they can play like 45 instruments between them, and then they can also play in different modes. They can play music from Turkey, music from North Africa, music from North India, music from Brazil. So that could be a, a total fusion mess. So how did they organize <coughs> these modes and these instruments to make such a, such a careful ensemble of music? It's because they worked on permutations. So we try to apply this method to the editing um, by working with photographs and, and arranging the photographs like they arranged their modes and they arranged their instruments. And the same with, with uh, here, there's a moment when you see the, uh, the so-called black and white house. You see the murals and you can see that the black and white house <coughs> some water. Sorry. 
you can see that the black and white house is, is made of geometric shapes. So there you can see that we try to edit the black and white house according to the music that is performed by these students. So we, in a way, we kept looking at that house and we realized the, the, the mural was already a rhythm and the rhythm already suggested music. So the house itself suggested a, a composition, a rhythmic composition. So it wasn't that we were applying that to the music, it was the other way around. The, the, the patterns on the black and white mural guided how we thought about filming it. So we filmed it to be edited. We envisioned the whole thing just from studying it. So, so each time there is this impulse to, to, use, to, to, to use music as a guide to the imaginative shaping of images rather than comprehending music via, <laughs> via a frame. That's the aspiration. Are there any questions that they would like to ask? In that case, I suppose we can continue. Uh, if there's any questions, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to, to, to bring on board. Um, we still have a few more minutes. Um, so perhaps maybe I would um, go into, into this idea that Anjali was, was mentioning at the beginning of uh, the sort of cosmogony or non-dualistic universes. Um, and sort of the way with which um, in previous works you've, you've been dealing with the future and this sort of um, imaginaries of, of the future through sound, through filmic, through essayistic forms of, of, of filmic practice. Um, and I was wondering if we, if, if we, can, t we can talk about the future. I mean, yes. <coughs> Excuse me, I've just come back from a long travel, so aeroplanes and too much smoking. But um, the, um, the essayistic also allows us, like um, writing allows us, to compact forms of time, you know, to layer, to assemble forms of time, um, and to propose a speculative space of non-dualism through the assembly of various registers of time. Um, the future uh, is highly political, as we would all agree, in terms of the Anthropocene, to think, oh, how terrible it is, you know, for instance, that, you know, we are now in charge of the weather, um, you know, how terrible it is that all this climate change is going on. I mean, it's people, were called inhuman. Their bodies were used to mine matter that they were removed from, and caught, you know, this idea of like splitting humans from the from matter has produced violence that has been impacting on the bodies of brown and black people for as long as imperialism has been in place. So, the idea that uh, this um, the damage that has been done is new. It's not new for some people. It's been going on for a long time. So to be able to think around trauma, but also around possibility and potential, and to think around assembling all of these temporalities together is what the essayistic allows us to do, in a way. So therefore, you, you think what the future I mean, is right now, you know. Um, it's within our reach, if you like. I think um, one way to think about um, the questions of futurity in this video is, you know, the very beginning of the video, um, the, uh, the vice principal, the poem she reads is a poem by Tagore, and it has a quite a complicated temporal structure. It's, it's directed to somebody in the future 
who is reading the poem that Tagore is writing. Um, and so right there, the, that, that poem sets up a, a temporal structure of the a future, a future that a future that looks back to the time of writing in order to look forward. So it's quite a, te quite a complex structure right from the beginning. Um, and in a way, uh, we saw this poem as a certain kind of diagram for time, a certain kind of diagram for what you could call a temporal travelogue. Um, you know, what we tend to know as time travel. So we tend to think of travelogue in terms of people visiting different countries, different geographies, different spaces. But you can also think of it in terms of visiting different time zones. So I think in a lot of our work, there is an, an aspiration to, uh, to the trans-temporal, the trans-historical, uh, and to work with... Um, kind of jumping across a timeline. In the, in the, the work we've just completed, which uh, we presented in uh, uh, the Sharjah Architectural Triennial, uh, a work called Infinity Minus Infinity, there is this desire to move across time zones, to move from um, 2014, the beginning of uh, the, the British Immigration Act, which puts the, the, which the Tories use to, to instigate the deprivation of citizenship that is popularly called uh, the Windrush scandal. Uh, so we trace the hostile environment through its legal structure from 2014, all the way back to the British Nationality Act of 1948. But then at the same time, we talk about the um, the abolition of slavery in 1833 and the fact that slave owners uh, were compensated 20 million pounds for the loss of their so-called property, whereas slaves got nothing, and the fact that British taxpayers have been paying off that loan until 2015. So right away you can hear the dates. You can hear 2014, 1948, 1833, 2015. And uh, the new video is moving back and forwards across those dates. The very first video we made was called Otterlith Timeline and was a timeline that began with uh, Angelica's grandmother, who's an educationalist, <coughs> and then moved forward to the time of 2003 when we presented the work and then went into the far future, the future that provided the point of departure for the first Otterlith work. So, so this interest in temporality, chronology, and history is part of what um, we think of as a temporal deprogramming. It's part of what we think of as temporal reclamation, the, the desire to move back and forwards across time and develop uh, an audiovisual language that is uh, plastic enough for us to do that. Um, and it's so the, the t and so, but the trick is that you have to, or the, the challenge is that you have to reinvent this for each project. You can't like transpose an idea that worked for a previous project and redo it for a new one. It won't work. So you have each time you have to come up with different poetics of temporal deprogramming, different aesthetics of temporal reclamation. You have to rethink it for the, so that each project has a, has a necessity and has a reason for existing. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge. So I would say that the question of the future <coughs> takes place within the large question of the chronopolitical, mm -hmm. the, uh, the politics of time, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that we live in, in a time of, of what you can call drastically advanced regression. That's the diagram of our present. The, the kind of, you call it populism, I just say it's straight out fascism, whether that's here in Britain or the UK or India or Brazil, it's fascism, it's neo-fascism. And 
I would characterize fascism in terms of drastically advanced regression, this forward-looking backwardness. Which is, and, uh, which is and being produced by multiple forms of enclosure. Mm -hmm. And so, the method yeah. is, is and, and the question is how to hack, mm. how to hack this diagram, how to hack the, the kind of the chronopolitics of fascism, what to do with it, and how to do it from where you are. If, if what you do is video, then you need to do, use video. If you do architecture, you need to do in architecture. If you use design, from, as, as well as going out and demonstrating, you also need to put your own medium into the desire to intervene. So, so the, the politics of time and the intervention in the future is part of our desire to, um, to, to hack the temporal diagram of fascism, which attempts to contain all of us at this moment. Thank you, Kroger. This was a, an incredibly eloquent way of introducing our program for the next two years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so be, be welcome to join us. Uh, we still have a few more minutes, I'd say about five minutes for um, last questions. Um, would anyone want to address a burning inquiry? It doesn't have to be a perfect question. It can be a thought. It can be a whatever. We have, yeah, we have a comment. question up there. Hello, hello, Cedric. hello. I have one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two, actually. Um, I just wanted to know very simply what was the brief from the curators initially. And uh, I, I, I don't know if it was the first time you were showing it as a screening, but I know you were wondering if it was going to work. Uh, um, I mean, you, you devised the work for uh, an exhibition in the first place, and I wanted to know how you thought about the, the installation um, kind of mode and the screening mode in the making of the film. Um, the curator didn't uh, give us a brief. No curators give us any brief. And if they did, we'd ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> Firstly. <laughs> so, <laughs> secondly... Um, uh, the and we do ignore it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes to our cost. <laughs> I think if if we just did, if we did, you know, because they curators try to nudge you without saying it. They try to suggest things, so you, you 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 go, yeah, that's really fascinating, and then you just ignore it and do what you already plan to do anyway. I mean, Grant Watson is a really old friend, and you know, he is. Um, somebody who I really respect. Actually, he is one of the few people who's like, few British people who's done something really amazing in India. He's a complete Indophile. He was probably Indian in his last life or something. He is really like, knows a lot about India and he doesn't speak Hindi or Bengali, but he cooks really good dal, so I know that there's something going on there. Um, and I trust him, you know. But he also trusts us, you know. It's, um, it's a long friendship, a long relationship that we've developed. And <clears throat> I come from the fam a family of modernists and communists and people involved in decolonization in India. And he knows for the last 10 years that we've always wanted to make a film in Shantinikaitan. So I think we kind of inspire each other in a way. Um, there are certain curators we have very good long relationships with, like Anselm Frank as well, um, who we've been having ongoing conversations with. There's no hierarchy there of Anselm originating an idea and us following the... You know, it's, there's simultaneous forms of emergence that simultaneous simultaneity or different ideas that we want to see kind of happen. There isn't really a hierarchy that we observe relating to the idea of a curator. I mean, if a curator can help actually do something, for instance, like carry something, you know, when you're shooting or, you know, raise more money from outside of their institution or like write text that spends, you know, hours with you cooking, chopping onions for the crew and making, you know, if they can do all of those things, 
you know, I don't know, like, so, you know, the, the, we, we also curate, so... Um, I think it was important because, yeah. because this work um, took longer, had a longer production process, had a longer <coughs> research process. Um, so we shot more footage, recorded more sound, travelled more. Um, so all of that needed, uh, needed curatorial support. But actually Beth did chop onions and fight drone operators. Yeah, so <laughs> you, <laughs> no, need, she, you need curators who can... <laughs> she did all that who can roll up their sleeves and be part of the production process. Mm -hmm. um, and in this work especially, because it's, uh, it, it, the duration of it was more epic. It just took longer and required more people, as you can see from the credits, which are effectively a short video in themselves. Um, and the, the installation process, there was always a sense that, that, that um, that it needed a specific type of installation structure. Um, I think as we went there, we realized that, that the semicircle around which the children sit would, could, could easily be transposed into an exhibition space so that you could build an exhibition space which in some way spoke to what you were seeing in the screen. And so that's what we've tried to do in the Rubin Museum where it premiered. There's a kind of circular seating structure. In the Xenogenesis exhibition in Van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, there's a kind of semicircular structure with a kind of... Um, uh, it mimics the, what you see in the beginning of the film, the circle. Yeah, with a kind of the foam, children sitting, a foam... With the blackboard. Is the a kind of foam platform. Mm. Um, in Sharjah, the... the um, the exhibition that we've just launched will end in Sharjah in a couple of years' time. And, and so we were just there looking at the space. So uh, we located this kind of field at the back of the foundation, which is not really used, but actually could work really well. So there is this, there is this aspiration to extend... extend uh, the screen space into installation space, especially because it's 80 minutes. Um, so you, you have to create an inviting space, to a welcoming space that people want to step into and want and to in stay in. And in the Yeah, so that people want to stay, so that, you know, so the kind of the slightly punitive, slightly puritanical mode of viewing where people sit on a, on a bench with no back support, and they're just supposed to be grateful for that. No, that won't work. You need to invite people and, and, and say welcome. But also because this video is not, it's not narrative. It doesn't have a beginning or middle or end. It's, it's a continual series of flows. So you can, you can kind of enter certain, you can enter it in a certain way, but then the idea is to seduce you into staying, like hang around a bit. Just stay, sprawl, spread out, relax, bring your friends. And uh, so there is this invitation to be a bit horizontal with the, with the work. Like fall asleep, wake up, it's still going. It will, be, it will be going, you know. There is that invitation. And with this work, maybe more than most. And I think just to add that the viewing experience of, uh, of the video in Xeno, uh, Xenogenesis was, was quite uh, was beautiful because you don't experience it only on, on this purely horizontal frontal level, but you do really have a sense of circularity that goes from the ground up, uh, which was really beautiful to experience. We just showed it in the desert outside Sharjah on a 40-foot screen with a 4K projector in this kind of, uh, this site behind which was an ex excavated fort and behind that was the motorway, and behind that is the mountains, and above that is the moon. And uh, so that was, you know, that was pretty epic. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, un, it's not clear that we will ever match that experience. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it worked in that it held the space. And also it's in it the did. global south, so the whole crew were all Bangladeshis or, you know, like... It was, 
it was just a very beautiful experience, like cosmic experience to sort of, and in the context of an architecture triennale, it was quite interesting, so. To say the least. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, the, the this idea of the blackboard and the, 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 the a film as a kind of space of learning uh, has been something also continuously, continuously applicable in our work because we were very influenced by third cinema, this idea of using film as an educational tool and the idea of being able to turn it off and on and think about deconstructing cinema, which was the whole third cinema movement from Argentina. So, And the um, idea of putting the, the, the screen inside you know, replacing like the blackboard um, for us was like to be inside this safe space of a yellow circle and to mm. think with pedagogy as such, be a student in a way. Yeah, Semben, <coughs> Usman Semben's idea of uh, cinema as a l'école du soir, cinema as an evening school, um, and then Serge Dany's idea of cinema as a as a screen that watches over you cinema that watches over you and watches you grow up. And then Goddard's idea of, you know, the screen as a blackboard and the film viewer as a student of cinema and society itself as a school. So all these ideas, uh, these, they, are, they are kind of cinematic ideas of school which bring together spectatorship and study and the screen and pedagogy. And, um, and we take these ideas very seriously and, and the effort is, is in a way to, to continually renew those ideas and to invite people into them, you know, to, 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 because they are, they are there to be activated. They appear latent and dormant and inactive, but they're not. They can be uh, reanimated in in quite simple ways, really, they are parameters. So maybe on on this idea of togetherness of forms and people, maybe we could end the session here. And I uh, I thank you very much all for coming, and thank you to Kodrin and Jolly for uh, coming up to Nottingham today. Uh, so please join me in well, thank you, our speakers. <laughs>